just a little bit about me. I, I own a, a company called the Good Seat Company. Um, our tagline is heirloom seats for common use. And I agreed to take this company over. It was a, a friend of mine actually in Washington State. And uh, he was in his late 70s. He'd been growing uh, and living off the grid and growing uh, his own, all his own food uh, on 600 acres up in the Okanagan Highlands. And had to do a lot of work to identify varieties that did well in their climate. And their climate is very similar to ours. So he saved all the seeds and then he started to sell them. And then when he got into the mid-70s, he decided, okay, that's enough of that. And it was right about the time the internet was taking off and it was just, he didn't want to have to figure that out. <laughs> so, um, but I took it on because of, just with my background and interest, I was finding myself learning about the state of our seed. Our tagline is heirloom seeds for common use because our we have survived to this day and age as human beings because we learn to save seeds and we learn to share and we had free capacity to share seeds and that's actually becoming more and more difficult with the uh, industrial model of seed saving and seed production so common use means available to all uh, and that's what we're all about, is we only sell varieties that are in the public domain and that are savable. And we teach, we spend a lot of our time teaching people to save seeds. Our goal is to be, you know, obsolete, hopefully, because people are saving their own seeds and our community has built up its seed supply. So that's really what the seed company is all about. And what I learned, and I actually thought this was, I didn't know anything, which is probably a good thing, but I, what I learned as I started this process is that somehow, by the time we've gotten to this day and age, a lot of us have come to this perception that one, growing is hard, and two, seed saving is this complicated thing, and other people know how to do it, and I can't. Like, I, I need a PhD or something. And I'd just like to remind everybody that the first people who saved seeds didn't have a PhD, you know. And so we all can save seeds, and we've been doing it for so long that is actually in our DNA. Like, if you start this process, your intuition will tell you what to do next. It's super easy, it's not complicated. And I'm just gonna walk us through some three basic questions that are good to ask yourself when you're seed saving, when you're planning your garden for seed saving, so that you can be more successful. Um, and that's, it's really, that's it. So, um, what's at stake? So, why is this so important? Just as I started to say earlier, um, about a hundred so or so years ago, uh, we had 96% more varieties of uh, agriculturally important crops in the United States than we have today. We've lost 96% of that biodiversity. It's just gone, and it's gone. Um, <clears throat> well, before we get there, um, why is that important? So we created, we as humans created all the biodiversity that we have. Um, and we've done that over 16,000 years of just identifying for, uh, crops in the, in the field that we liked and selecting for characteristics that we uh, appreciated and then saving the seeds from those varieties that we liked and sharing them with others. Um, so I'd like to point this out. This is what a wild carrot looks like. Pretty different from the carrots we eat today. That's wild corn and of course wild uh, old wheat or original wheat, very different from modern wheat. And we did all that. We, we our ancestors got us from wild corn or, and wild carrots to the orange and now purple carrots that we eat today. Um, so we have that knowledge and capacity and it's just come from selecting for characteristics that we think are important. And of that selecting, saving, and sharing seeds, all three of them are important. And sometimes I argue that the most important of those is the sharing because it mixes up the DNA and it maintains the biodiversity. And if you think about it, um, pretty much every species on the planet requires uh, a mixing up of the DNA to keep the vibrancy of the genetics strong. You know, we have cultural mores in our, as humans, in every culture that prevent us from creating with our siblings because we know that that just doesn't produce strong bonding. So, you know, we as humans do that and, and pretty much every species on the planet does it and so do plants. 
And so uh, it's really important to, to allow those, the, allow the DNA to mix. And you do that by sharing seeds with others. I, I'll take just a quick second. There's a gentleman named Will Bonsell who tells a story. He's a farmer in Vermont, and he tells a story of there's a hollow in the northern uh, uh, parts of Vermont where um, about 100 years ago, all the farmers grew one kind type of corn because it did really well in this hollow, which tended to get a lot of uh, frost. And I think it was called white or something. And, uh, but corn, as we'll learn in a minute, uh, hybridizes very quickly and cross pollen is pretty easy. And corn pollen can travel long distances, over a mile. So if you're wanting to save a particular variety of corn, you want, you, don't, you, you want all your neighbors to grow that same type of corn. But corn also is subject to um, inbreeding and genetic, uh, uh, what's it called when it, uh, I'm slightly out of it, when the, the genetics will go down pretty quickly if you don't share the seeds, if you don't mix up the DNA. The word will come back to me Depression. pretty quickly. But at any rate, uh, what is it? Depression. Depression, there we go, thank you. Uh, so anyways. Uh, in this hollow, what they would do is at Christmas time, every, so everybody grew white lightning, midnight lightning corn, and it was because it was a good sweet corn, but they, you, you could also feed it to the, uh, the domesticated animals, and uh, and, it was, and it also made a good flower corn. So, anyways, at Christmas time or at the holidays, everybody would go visiting to all the other neighbors' farms, and you would bring a mason jar and a bag of corn from your own stock. And you go to your, before you went into your neighbor's house, you go to his barn, his barn, and uh, you take out a scoop of corn from into your mason jar, and then you dump your corn into his stash. And now you had some of his midnight lightning corn to take back and plant, mix up with yours and plant, and then and he had some of yours. And if everybody did that, it kept the genetics and the and prevented um, you know, depression, genetic depression of the corn. So. Okay, so now the last thing about this is that in order to do that, you have to have uh, a, a variety with stable genetics, and this is what we call open pollinated or heirloom seeds. Heirloom simply means that all the. Um, yes. Hold an example of unstable genetics. So uh, hybrid, a new hybrid. So, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, when you when you create when you first cross pollinate two two plants and produce the progeny seed. Genetics are pretty mixed up in there from two different varieties, and you um, the uh, you're less able to pre to predict the outcome of the progeny seed, and we'll walk through that in a minute. Um, so I think what I was going to say is that heirloom seeds are simply open pollinated seeds where we have selected for a particular characteristic that we like and shared that with um, ancestors, friends, or or not answers, but you know, next generations. Um, so back to this question of how did we get here, how we got here is um, in the seed industry has started probably over the last 60 or 70 years, started to develop, or actually it's probably closer to 100, has developed more and more hybrids. And a hybrid seed is, a hy is where you have two, two parent um, varieties that have a characteristic that you like and you've inbred them so you can be guaranteed that the genetics will always produce that characteristic that you like. And then you crossbreed those two inbred parents and you produce um, a new variety that's this special grade hybrid. And the, the food that you eat from that hybrid seed is going to be great and delicious, but the seed that that hybrid plant produces is going to have messed up genetics. And I often talk about this in the context of um, dog breeding because people seem to get that easier. So if you think of, you know, these new poodle-related doodles, right, whatever they are, labradoodles. So, so somebody has taken, so when you make a new dog breed, I think we all understand, the dog breeder is selecting for the characteristics that make that labrador. And now all the labradoodles have really stable genetics. And the same thing with a poodle. But now when you cross the poodle and the Labrador, you get a lot of cute puppies, but they're going to be all kind of mixed up. You know, some of them are going to look more lab, some of them are going to look more poodle, some will look like what we want is a Labrador. To make, 
to create the new breed of a Labradoodle takes a lot of um, crossing of these next generations until you can uh, sustainably produce everything that will always look like a Labradoodle. Does that make sense? You're going to be doing that for several generations. So that's the same thing. That first generation of these mixed up puppies is the same thing as what we would call a hybrid at, at the plant level. Um, if you would imagine that instead of puppies you had seed and then you planted those, you can't guarantee what what this next generation is going to look like. And oftentimes, because of the way that inbreeding happens, the seed is often sterile. So it's it's difficult to um, reliably save seed from a new hybrid. And so the tendency is to just not focus on that. And just which is a good for a seed company because that means you'll keep coming back to me to buy more seed. Not me, not necessarily me, but someone who sells hybrid seed. And that's been quite attractive to the seed industry. So there's this big tendency to move towards more hybrids. We, we want the latest fancy, this kind of uh, variety of tomato or corn or carrot. Um, and we've come to, to just rely on the seed company to provide the seed and we don't have to save it. Um, so, so there's so the seed companies are making more hybrids, so there's less of pollinated seed, and there's more plant patenting. So now the seed companies are also claiming that they own the genetics of these new varieties, and now and that limits our access to them, and they're controlling which varieties they're selling. So we're losing we are losing um, the varieties because we're losing access to the seed. Uh, there's also genetically modified seed, which is also impacting the variety of seeds available to us. And then there's the consolidation of seed companies. So it's worth breaking this up because I don't think we necessarily know this. Um, up until 2017, between 2013 or, and 2017, um, the seed, industrial seed industry was dominated by three major, uh, with six major companies. Um, the, the big companies are, the chemical aspects of these companies are in red, um, the seed companies are in blue, and the green companies are genetically engineered, engineering companies. But they, they manage over 90 some odd percent of the industrial seed supply for the world. And, uh, and then in 2017, and you'll notice that the major uh, and, and the size of the circles has to do with their market share. And of course, we're all familiar with Monsanto. I think it brings a bell to everybody, whatever you may think of them. But you'll notice that the market share is held by chemical companies, and they own seed companies. And then in 2017, there were three major mergers in the you know tens of billions of dollars, and consolidated these. Monsanto. Uh, Consol uh, merged with Bayer, which is the little one on the right you can't really see, for $66 billion. DuPont and Dow merged for $130 billion. And Syngenta, which is a chemical company, merged with a company that nobody had ever heard of called Chem China, because they were the, out of China, and nobody knew they existed. They're the largest chemical company in China. And this is what it looks like today. So now we just have three, uh, three major players. Monsanto has disappeared. It's now um, fully owned by Bayer. So the name Monsanto is likely going to disappear. Uh, and then DuPont and Dow have come up with a new name, which I can't, Cortiva, I think is what it is. Yeah, Cortiva. And, uh, um, and Syngenta have been subsumed by China. Uh, so just, it's just an FYI. And the decisions that are being made about which seeds are important are being made by a chemical company. It's just a different mindset than the way we as gardeners think about seed. I'm not going to go into it too much more. Uh, there's, a chem there's a community conversation happening this afternoon about the seed industry and um, the issues with it and the solutions that we can come up with. And I invite you all to attend. It starts at 1.15. But I do think it's, it's important that we all know what's happening. So. Back to us and why we want to save seed, um, and, and why biodiversity is important. All the species that are still on the planet today have the ability to be adapted to change. 
So we've got algae and sharks and flowering plants and bees that have been around for at least 30 million years. And they have all learned to be adaptive to change. That's a key to resiliency. So biodiversity is important for resiliency. And uh, um, as humans, we're still trying to figure that out. And in order to, to survive, to figure that out as humans, we have to be able to eat. In order to be able to eat, we have to be able to have access to biodiverse and resilient seed. So I do also just like to point this out. People often ask about the seed vault in Norway. This is the work of Perry Fowler, an American conservationist who gathered seeds from all over the world and had them buried, uh, built, had uh, Norway build this, uh, it's called the Doomsday Vault, and it's saving a supply of um, open pollinated seeds from every country in the world under about a mile of permafrost on an island called um, Svalbard uh, in the North Pole. And that's fabulous, and that's wonderful, and that's amazing. It's one of the few things every country in the world has agreed to without any issue or frustration, uh, because we all get that seeds are important. But it's under, a, you know, a mile in Norway, and that's not going to do us in the Flathead Valley a whole lot of good uh, if, in fact, the world does have a catastrophic effect. So, um, which is why we want community seed saving programs. So, Free the Seas is focusing on community food systems. They're very important to our viability as a species and as a community, and of course, at the top of that starting point, which is producers and food, we need to start with seed. So, um, saving our seed and providing a, a local seed supply of vibrant, biodiverse, genetically strong seed is key to a vibrant system. All right, so that's my plug about why we should save seed and why it's so important. Um, and now we're going to get to our questions. We're going to focus on these three questions. I'll walk us through them um, one by one, but here they are. The, when you want to save seeds, the first question to ask yourself when you're going to grow the plant is, are the seeds I'm about to plant going to produce progeny seed that will grow true to type? Will it produce basically the same plant that I grew today? So that's called true to type. And two, does the plant that grows from the seed self-pollinate? Does it pollinate itself, in which case we call it a sulfur? Or is it promiscuous? Is it cross-pollinate? So are they sulfurs or crossers? And three, knowing what kind of seed I have, a sulfur or a crosser, what do I need to consider when I'm planting that seed? So those are the three questions. So will my seeds grow true to type? So this is the open pollinated versus the hybrid. We've walked through that already. Um, hybrids, generally speaking, will not grow true to type. And GMO seeds will also will not grow true to type. I'll get to GMOs in a minute. So just basically, you want to be able to start with an open pollinated seed. Now. The scary part is that I used to be able to stand up here and say open pollinated seeds are in common use. Now I have to be careful about that because the seed companies are taking those hybrids and doing the work to convert them into open pollinated seeds, but they're doing them under the um, constraints of a patent so that even though they're open pollinated, <coughs> and they may sell it to you, and you may have a license to plant that seed and eat the crop that, um, that you grow from that seed, you may not have a license to save the seed from that crop. That's what's happening here. So that's pretty freaking scary to me. So the good seed company only sells open pollinated seeds that are in the public domain. These are all these things are hundreds of years old, and we don't I don't look at newly open pollinated seed because that's just not what we're all about. Because I want to be able to have confidence to say, you can save the seed, this is your seed. I also want us to understand that I believe this is our right as humans to have access to these seeds. Um, and it's, it's just incredibly devastating to me to see that we're limiting that capacity from a, a, a mindset that has no understanding of our history and our future. Okay. So, <laughs> so a thing about hybrids. Um, your, if you buy hybrid seed, again, there's nothing wrong with hybrid seed for eating. Um, it'll, the, 
package will either say hybrid on it, and I've circled it up there, or it will say F1. In Europe, they, because that's just a scientific term for the first generation, filial one is what it means. And in Europe, they tend to use F1 as a designation. In the US, we tend to say hybrid on our package, but it'll say one of the three. Now, I want to point this out. You'll notice that the middle packet says organic. And people kind of get confused between organic and hybrid and open pollinated. What, what do all these terms mean? So I want to take a minute to talk about that. Organic has to do with the way we grow our food or our plants. It means that we grow, um, we start with non-GMO seed and then we grow it under conditions that are defined as organic. And I've got them up here on the corner, which means without pesticides, chemical pesticides, without fertilizers that have uh, sewage sludge or synthetic ingredients, and um, without ionizing radiation. So those are the definitions for certified organic. So you can have a hybrid seed and it would still, that is organically grown and that's completely fine, but it's important to, to pay attention to the difference. Does that make sense? So the hybrid has to do with the seed, organic has to do with how that plant was originally grown, how that seed was originally grown or the plant that produced that seed rather. Moving on to GMOs. So the yes. absence of hybrid or F1 means it's open pollinated. Yes. They don't label it. Unless it says GMO and you won't. So for GMOs, just so you know, uh, GMO it, seeds are currently not available at the backyard gardeners level. So you will, should not, at least for the time being, ever have to deal with a seed packet that says GMO, but it, they do are required to label it if it's in fact GMO versus GM as a whole the same So just make sure that I'm understanding the term open pollinated sure. correctly is basically if you're making a hybrid, it's closed pollinated because you only want a certain no. of it. So the phrase open pollinated meant that um, you could you could grow this variety in the presence of other members of the grow and mm -hmm. still produce more progeny of the same. Okay. Whereas when I'm trying to make a hybrid, it's highly um, engineered in terms of the cross-pollination. I, I pick a very select inbred parent of one line that has, uh, I don't know, it, uh, you know, the yellow, the yellow banana pepper. And then I have another inbred parent of another line that's got a particular chipotle flavor. I'm making this up as I'm going. <laughs> you know, and I produce a hybrid that's yellow and makes a chipotle flavor. Um, but if I, just then now take that hybrid and let it pollinate among its, its progeny, I'm going to get a gamish moving on. I'm not going to get more yellow chipotle. Mm -hmm. So does so, that make sense? Yeah. So okay. open pollinated means both likely that the seeds that were that you're buying were created from plants that were just hanging out with other plants. And, there's, and their genetics are right. stable. Right. I haven't just been, two inbred parents haven't just yeah. been Okay, so just a minute about GMOs. Um, it, so far, they have typically been commodity crops, which are the soy, canola, cotton, sugar beets, rice, and cereals that are up at the top. They're starting to get into the plant varieties, and I've highlighted those there. Historically, genetically modified organism plants were developed in order to create um, a mechanism for being able to um, treat a, a field with an herbicide without impacting the plant of interest. And uh, not surprisingly, over time, the uh, herbicide, the herbs that, that uh, we were trying to kill developed a resistance to the herbicide. And so we have, we've not been successful. That, that approach has not been successful. Um, let me just move on here. Uh, and the reason I'm the reason I am st stopping myself is that we used to be able to rely on the requirement for labeling of genetically modified organisms. The way they did, the way and this was mostly through the work of Monsanto. The way they did this is they had an organism that was from a different species that they had to um, inject through at, in a laboratory process into the genetics of the plant, and so that was a genetically modified organism. But now, you can actually modify the DNA uh, without inserting an organism, a, 
gene from a different organism. So that labeling actually is going to be going away, although it's going to be producing the same result. So you won't have access to that knowledge about GMOs that we used to we used to rely on, um, which is where organics are going to become more and more important as a definition. So the second piece that I think it's important to know, because this goes back to the organic and the, the understanding about how plants are grown, the active ingredient in uh, Roundup, which was the reason, which was the herbicide that was the reason for creating these GMOs in the first place, was um, was active. What was a broad spectrum of herbicide? Great. Okay. Fine. But now what they've discovered is that, the I'm not going to go through the mechanism because I realize I'm talking too much and I haven't gone to the seed saving, I apologize. Um, what I want to say is that the mechanism by which glyphosate works, which glyphosate is the primary ingredient in Roundup, is it's a desiccant. And so they have discovered that it's actually a useful product to spray on any plant, whether it's a GMO plant or not, towards the end of its life when you're trying to mature the seed. And the crop where you're trying to mature the seed is wheat, right? We use mature wheat seed for our uh, grains, for our breads, for our cereals, for our crackers, all other grains like that. And it turns out if you spray glyphosate on the crop while it's trying to mature, you can speed up and you can um, kind of dial in the timing of maturation. So it's a very efficient system from a farmer's perspective. And we have now absorbed a whole lot more glyphosate as consumers than we used to, because this doesn't this this application towards the end of a plant's life doesn't require it's useful on all plants whether they're genetically modified or not. So you, there's no way to know whether unless you buy an organically grown uh, product, unless you grow you buy product from organically grown food, there's no way to know. Uh, whether it's been treated with glyphosate or not. So these are pre-harvest desiccation crops, corn, cereals, oil seeds, legumes, sunflowers, potatoes, and cotton. These are products where they have identified glyphosate in the products. These are things that our children are eating. These are things that we think are safe. Um, yeah. But, and I don't mean to point out Kellogg's. This is just probably just where I cut this out. Um, you know, no one's paying attention. No one's telling us this is like this is just happening. Period. Okay, so let's go back to what we can do. Let's go back to our seed saving. In order to understand about sulfurs or crossers, let's just take a quick look at um, the parts of a flower. So the green stalk in the middle is the is the style, and at the very top is a stigma, that thing that looks like a helipad landing surface. So that's where pollen. That's the female part of the plant. That's where pollen, which is um, is made by the anthers, those two yellow things, um, it, that pollen lands on the stigma, it's sticky, and then um, the pollen then will travel down that tube to these ovules, which are basically plant eggs, fertilize them, and that's where your seeds are made. So on some plants, you'll notice that the, both the anthers and the stigma are within the same flower. And that's called a perfect flower. And on some plants, I'll come back, the flowers, the male and female parts are on different flowers, on different parts of the plant. Or they can be on different plants. So here's, you know, if you think about the corn plant, the tassel, that's where the pollen is made, is at the top. But you know all those silk ears? Those are these, those are the stigmas. So the, when the, the pollen uh, sticks to the top of the long, long silk ear and travels all the way down, and uh, when it pollinates, this little ovule, that's how you get your corn kernels. Have you ever gotten a corn, uh, opened a corn cob and it's you know, only, only half the kernels, they only start halfway down? So that means the top half of didn't get pollinated. Okay, so and here's squash flowers. The male flower is here. The stigmas, in, I mean the anthers are inside. And you'll, next time, if you don't know this, next time you grow your squash plant, you'll notice that some of them have these bulbs at the bottom, and that's where the ovule is. And so, um, and the and uh, squash plants are, are pollinated by insects, um, and they're pollinated by a lot of uh, land insects, land bees that uh, will sleep inside those those 
the flowers and be ready to pollinate and, and uh, uh, first thing in the morning, way before you get up. Okay, so I want to go back to sulfur flowers. So this, again, was a sulfur flower. And these plants are called sulfur vegetables because they are basically self-pollinating. They're pollinated from regular uh, perfect flower. So beans, peas, lettuces, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. These are really good species to start your seed saving with because you can pretty much grow them without having to worry about cross-pollination and know that you'll get good quality variety of your tomatoes that you like or your peppers or your beans. Um, now, and the really cool thing about this is that um, you know, uh, we live in a climate that can get hot in midsummer, and, and we watch our lettuce bolt, and we can feel sad about that. But now we can say, I'm making seed. So we can go from bolting to seed production pretty quickly. Um, okay, now I, you'll notice that the, on the right hand side I have a comment there about the Latin names. I've included the Latin names, and I'm going to tell you why they're helpful to pay attention to. Um, your seed packet should have the the Latin name on it, um, and uh, if it doesn't, then don't buy from that company again, it's not helpful. Uh, the way Latin <laughs> names work is um, the, you'll, the, there's the genus, which is the first name and it's capitalized, and then there's the species, which is the second name and that's small letter. And uh, I'll explain why this is important in a minute. Okay, so now, we're, so now we're gonna go to Examples of crossers like corn and squash. Here, these are some examples of crossers. Uh, corn, as I said, crosses pretty easily. Cucumbers cross pretty easily. All the musk melons, all the melons, all the squashes, these are all crossers. And if you think about it, you know how we, we always see those cornucopias of crazy looking squashes of all different shapes and sizes and colors? It's because they're just cross pollinating like crazy. They're very promiscuous. That's how you can get so many cool looking, weird, but delicious tasting squash. So that's another thing. When you're saving seed, there, there's a level of at which, of, of um, what do I want to say here? So I have a seed company and I have to be able to say that when you're buying this type of squash, a butternut squash, I'm going to be selling you a butternut squash seed. But in my home garden, I am nowhere near a strict because I'm just eating it for me. And if I mix a little bit of my butternut with my buttercup, I don't care. As long as it tastes good and it looks cool, I'm okay with it. So, you know, we don't have to be so strict and rigid. And I just really think that's important to pay attention to. But, so when we talk about crossing, what, what are going to cross are the same species. So notice this. We have, let me get to the right place here. Um, so let's look at our squashes, one because I can reach them. So we've got different kinds of squashes. We've got the buttercups, the hubbards, and the marrows, and they're all the same genus, Cucurbita, but they're a species maximum. Then we have another type of uh, squash, which is my butternuts, let's say, down here. And, but they're Cucurbita, but they're a different species than Monchata. So if the species is different, they're not going to cross pollinate. So that's important. If I'm trying to save seed. So um, that's why the Latin name is really helpful, right? They're not all the same. And in fact, um, uh, there is a cucumber, Armenian cucumber under melon, because it's actually a type of melon, but we eat it like a cucumber. So anyway, so it's worth paying attention to that. And watermelons, by the way, are a whole different genus, they're a whole different thing. So, you could grow your muskmelon and your watermelon nearby and not worry about cross pollination. Okay, make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so then I'd just like to take this one over because I love this example. Um, so Brassica oleracea. Um, this is one species of plant, one species of plant. And it also, and um, it produces all of the things that we call brassicas our kale, our kohlrabi, our broccoli, our Brussels sprouts, our cabbages, our cauliflowers. How is that possible? I'm using my arms as uh, stems or for leaves, and I don't know, the leaves just started to make these little rosettes rather than the leaves that we think of. 
And somebody thought that was great. And so we selected for that. We saved that particular seed. And they all make those little balls. A different type of that plant uh, made the cauliflower, which is an odd version of the flowering head. And broccoli is a different odd version of the flowering head. You'll notice that the flower, right, those anthers are sticking way up. Those, that thing crosses like crazy, right? All the, the wind just blows and all goes that pollen. So the reason I bring that up is that if you're saving for seed of a brassica, you really only want to save one species at a time, right? If I want to save my broccoli seed, I'm not saving seed from any other broccoli. I mean, any other brassica. Now, does that mean I can't grow all those other brassicas? No. I certainly can grow them all. I can even grow them right next to each other because I eat them before they go to seed. Right? We eat the, all of the brassicas we eat before they go to seed. But I want to ask how far apart, if we're going to save the seed of the kale, how far do we need them to be away from the whole mustard family? Well, not the whole mustard family because they'll be different species. Okay. So like your radish is a different species of brassica. But I'm just talking about the brassica oleraceae. So that's a good point. Okay. Um, so I think I bring this up for this point because this is also something where people can get kind of confused. I can grow all of these together in my garden and enjoy them all and you know have a feast and save them and freeze them and do whatever I do. But if I want to save seed, I'm only going to let one of them go to seed. But if I let two of them go to seed, I'm going to get chaos. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. All right. So. Last thing of the crossers, there's besides what we think of as our intermediate crossers are the biennials or the overwintering. So all of those that we've talked about so far will produce their seed in the same year that you plant the plant to eat food. There's another series of plants, that, and these are typically the root plants, where they actually don't produce their flowers and seeds till the second year. We don't even think of them of these because we, we typically eat the root vegetables before they ever go to seed. So that's our carrots, our beets, our radish, all of that. Um, these, you typically want to, um, there's a special process for saving them in the winter time. Some of them you can save here in the winter, keep them in the ground with a lot of mulch. Some of them you actually need to pull up and keep them in wet sand at about 50 degrees and then replant them in the spring. And the thing about these plants is, for them, they're, what they've done is they put all their energy into their root for the winter time, for that first, to make it through that first winter. So all their energy has gone into making that root that we now think is a delicious carrot. And then the following spring, they use that energy to make flowers and seed, because actually seed production is very expensive for a plant. Um, okay, so these just need a little more thought. So again, Garden planning considerations, if you're just starting out and you're kind of worried, just start with the sulfurs, like easy peasy. Um, here's the thing, tomatoes, you can save those seeds. When the, when the fruit is ripe to eat, the seeds are mature. So literally just squeeze the seeds out um, from your tomato when you harvest it, and, uh, and now you've got seeds that's ready to save. This is corn that's ready to be harvested, that's not very attractive for eating, right? This has been left on the plant until it dried, because we're saving seed. Same thing for peas and beans. And what else is on my plants? Um, so peas and beans, you're going to leave those pods on their um, vines until they're ready to be, until the seed is ripe. So the husk is going to be crispy and dry. Um, which is way past the eating stage. So that's, you gotta sit, think about, I gotta save this, some of these, and you wanna save some pots, if you've got six or seven different plants, save some pots from each of those plants, because they're all got slightly different genetics. Don't save all just from one plant. Make sense? Okay, um, peppers, you wanna wait till that fruit is mature. So even if you are eating, you're growing a green bell pepper, that is, we're actually eating those green bell peppers when they're immature. So you leave it on the plant until it turns its rightful color, which is red, and then and then you harvest it. Um, lettuces, same thing. You want to let the seed head dry on the plant. Now, crossers. So we want to grow those squashes together, right? But, but what do we do? So here's what I here's what you do. Believe it or not. Uh, remember, I told you that the land bees sleep in those flowers. So you will never get up earlier than the land bee. It will be already awake and pollinating 
your female flowers before you are, they sleep in the flower. <laughs> you can do it. You'll notice here's a, here's a female flower, because I can see the bulb at the bottom. When, it's, when I've seen the flower, and it's already going to be ready to be opening, but it's not open yet, I tape it closed. And I do the same thing with my male flower. And I, de I decided, okay, I found my male flower. And then I take my male flower's anther, and I use it like a paintbrush. I open my female flower. I uh, paint the pollen onto the female flower. And then I take that flower back up again. And then I somehow remind myself, this is the squash I want to save for seed. So it's a flag, it's a sign, it's a don't touch, it's a siren, it's whatever. So if you get an accidental cross-pollination, so I have the last year these zucchinis that crossed with butternut, and they were awesome. Cause See? They were these giant butternuts, but you can't save that and grow them. Well, you? you know, you can. You'll just get a gamish and just keep selecting for the one that you like and keep saving it and, and yeah. over a couple generations. It's not going to be as complicated as a true hybrid. Um, and just keep selecting for the, for the variety that's closest to that awesome flavor. And you've now made a new species. And you can call it, or not a new species, a new variety. And you can call it whatever you like. Yeah. And <laughs> share the seeds with your friends and neighbors. Okay, but do it over like generations. Yeah. So. Just keep saving the seeds, yeah. And you'll get you'll get some coopiness, but it's not going to be as complicated as if you go to going from a true hybrid, for sure. Um, okay, so when you've got crossers, I have like tape. Oh no, I just use like the blue sticky tape. Okay. Or masking tape. This we did some I saved some seed for two bear, and we just made an isolation um, cage for them because the uh, carrots are insect pollinated, so this protected them. Um, you can also plant at a distance that's farther than the, uh, the pollen will travel, either by insects or wind, depending on the plant. Um, you can also time plants differently, so some will flower earlier than later. But these are, these are uh, mechanisms that people have evolved for managing that capacity for cross-pollination. Um, you know, or only grow one variety of your Brassica oleracea that season. Um, this has a, a, a description of each of the plants, what their name is, how they're pollinated, the isolation distance, and you'll notice corn is up to a mile. I mean, it's incredibly hardy. Um, the number of plants in an ideal seed you want to be saving seed from, and some seed saving notes. Um, and again, these are for you know, people who really worry strongly about purity. For the backyard grower, we're a little less strict, which is why we have all this biodiversity that our ancestors gave us. It's fabulous. I think there's over 10,000 varieties of rice alone. It's incredible. So, and this is the advanced. Okay. So, um, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of resources available online, YouTube, books. Um, the Good Seed Company, Flathead Grows Community Seed Library, Center for Sustainability, and Entrepreneurship all have workshops. And white, I, at least the Whitefish High uh, School District <coughs> Education Community Education System all have uh, workshops that are free or nominal cost for doing for learning more. So there are a ton of resources available for you. Um, and then this is a plug for our community seed library. We have a community seed library in the Flathead Valley. This is a partnership with the Good Seed Company and Imaginative Libraries. It's dedicated to helping uh, teach our community to save seed and build our seed supply. So I really invite you to participate. Uh, think of saving seed for them. Um, think of coming to a seed packing party. Think of offering your resources at a workshop. Um, you are the means by which we can build our resilient seed community. Come back to Free the Seeds, host a workshop, host a booth, share your knowledge with others uh, for Saturday and lunch, as you know. And lastly, I wanted to do a plug for AeroMontana.org, AeroMT.org. It's an organization dedicated to sustainability. Um, it is the foundational sustainability organization for our state from 45 years ago that uh, promulgated the uh, excitement, interest, and energy that produced the legislation and organizations 
uh, in our community today related to renewable energy and sustainable ag. And they now are um, dedicating their efforts to helping empower communities build resilient food systems because that's the next level. Uh, any level of donation on a regular basis will make you a member uh, and uh, you will be supporting yourselves and your